on World News Tonight. Looming deadline. Some Western nations scramble for the August 31st while some nations make their last flight. Swirling Ida. Category 4 storm makes landfall in the Gulf Coast causing an array of damage. Vaccination doubts. Many nations are on the verge of mandating COVID-19 vaccinations for children. Bundles of joy. Nurses at an Illinois hospital gets a chance to celebrate the gift of life all together. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with a look into the developing situation in Afghanistan. Britain's Royal Air Force said that they are pleased with the extraordinary effort that has seen more than 15,000 people airlifted out of Kabul. Uh, Britain's ambassador to Afghanistan disembarked from one of the final UK military repatriation flights after it landed in Bryce Norton. Laurie Bristow returned to the UK from his post as ambassador to Afghanistan on one of the final flights out of the country, which is now under the control of the Taliban. He said on Saturday that the time had come to end an airlift which had evacuated almost 15,000 Afghan and British citizens over the past two weeks. On Friday, Britain had said its evacuation mission would end within hours and that its military would be unable to fly out any Afghan citizens eligible for resettlement who had not already entered Kabul airport. Chief of Joint Operations, Vice Admiral Sir Benjamin John Key said on the tarmac at Bryce Norton that the end of evacuations was not a moment of celebration. Britain's Defence Minister Ben Wallace predicted last week that time had run out to evacuate around 1,000 Afghans who were eligible to come to Britain, including former staff to the UK. More than 450 British Armed Forces personnel died during two decades of deployment in the country. France and the UK will urge the United Nations to work for the creation of a safe zone in the Afghan capital of Kabul to protect humanitarian operations. This statement comes as the evacuation deadline nears. Their white flag is unmissable outside Hamid Karzai airport, flying at the entrance, attached to cars and embellishing caps and bandanas. The Taliban have beefed up their presence around the site, while crowds of people trying to flee have dwindled. It comes amid further terror alerts. On Saturday night, U.S. President Joe Biden said an attack was highly likely within the following 36 hours. As airlift operations draw to a close, all remaining British troops left Afghanistan on Saturday. The U.S. has less than 4,000 soldiers left in the country and questions remain over what will happen past their August 31 pull-out deadline. France and the U.K. are calling for the creation of a U.N.-controlled safe zone in Kabul. According to French President Emmanuel Macron, this could allow vulnerable Afghans to be evacuated through civilian flights. Macron said, with the help of Qatar, preliminary discussions had begun with the Taliban. Paris and London are set to make the safe zone proposal at a UN Security Council meeting on Monday. They'll be joined by the US, Russia and China to discuss the situation in Afghanistan. The Israeli Air Force attacked two sites in Gaza, the army said, after Gazans clashed with forces on the border and launched incendiary balloons into southern Israel. These images from the Israeli army show two Gaza Strip sites it bombed overnight. According to the military, one was a tunnel used to attack Israel, the other was used to produce weapons and train Hamas militants. Since the war in May between Israel and Hamas, tension has remained high. Israel has tightened its economic blockade on the Palestinian territory to prevent Hamas from preparing new strikes, and that has made life extremely difficult for Gaza residents. That's why Palestinians launched on Saturday a new type of protest. Held at night all week long, they aim to escalate pressure so that Israel would be forced to lift the blockade and allow in financial aid from Qatar. 
Two Palestinians, including a 12-year-old boy, have died of their wounds after previous border clashes. An Israeli soldier was critically injured. Now there is concern the violence will escalate into a new armed confrontation. Yet in recent days, there has been progress in talks over the easing of commercial restrictions. Egypt partially opened its border with Gaza and helped mediate a deal that would have allowed Qatar funds to enter the territory under certain conditions. North Korea appears to have resumed its sole plutonium producer reactor, a move that could enable the regime to expand its arsenal of nuclear weapons. If confirmed, it would be the first time it has been rebooted in two and a half years. North Korea could soon be resuming production of its nuclear weapons. In its annual report dated Friday, the International Atomic Energy Agency said Pyongyang appeared to have restarted a nuclear reactor believed to have once produced plutonium for the country's nuclear arsenal. It said in its report that for two and a half years, there had been no indications of that reactor's operation at Yongbyon, a complex at the heart of Pyongyang's nuclear program, until July. It added that the apparent restart of the reactor coincides with indications of activity at a nearby uranium mine and plant. That comes after the IAEA said there had been signs at Yongbyon of possible reprocessing work to separate plutonium from spent reactor fuel earlier this year. The IAEA, which is the UN's atomic watchdog, called the new indications deeply troubling. It monitors North Korea from afar, largely through satellite imagery after its inspectors were expelled by Pyongyang in 2009. Starting from today, South Korea, the U.S. and the U.K. will hold joint training in the East Sea. The three nations will take part in ex exercises in preparation for future disaster relief missions until Wednesday. The U.K.'s HMS Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier and its escort ships will take part in combined training with the South Korean Navy in the East Sea starting Monday. Its purpose is to prepare for humanitarian disaster relief missions and will take place until Wednesday. The joint training includes U.S. vessels, some U.S. stealth aircraft, and large transport ships from the South Korean Navy, such as the Tokto class amphibious assault ship. So it's a combined training of three countries, the U.K., the U.S., and Korea. The U.K. had initially planned for its carrier to enter the port in the southeastern city of Busan, but it has been called off due to COVID-19 cases aboard the strike group vessels and the rising caseload in Korea. In the meantime, it's yet to be seen how North Korea will react to this training. It criticized the South once again on Sunday for conducting joint military training with the U.S. earlier this month and vowed to strengthen its absolute deterrence to cope with U.S. military threats. And the North has even halted its daily hotline communication with the South since August 10th, which had previously been reconnected after 13 months to show their opposition against the joint training. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Hurricane Ida hits Louisiana as a powerful Category 4 storm in the toughest test yet of the billion dollar spent on levee upgrades following Hurricane Katrina that devastated the southern U.S. city of New Orleans. 16 years to the day after Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans, Hurricane Ida made landfall as a Category 4 storm, bringing winds in excess of 200 kilometers an hour. High sea levels slammed into the barrier island of Grand Isle, flooding the spit of land around 150 kilometers south of the Crescent City. As the winds lash population centers, the state's governor urged people to stay on their toes. Despite being downgraded, Ida's sheer power is putting infrastructure under severe strain. Power was knocked out to all of New Orleans, and further outages are expected. Louisiana's system of levees is also being put to the test. They underwent a $16 billion overhaul after they were overwhelmed by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Also overwhelmed are the state's hospitals. Low vaccination rates plus the more transmissible Delta variant have seen large numbers of people being hospitalized with COVID-19. Casualties from Hurricane Ida could push the healthcare system beyond capacity.
Ida is now making its way northeastwards through the state and is expected to weaken as it makes its way towards the Atlantic coast by Wednesday. But for the residents of Louisiana, the danger is far from over. Several countries are considering whether to give COVID-19 vaccinations on a large scale to children as young as 12 years old. Experts from the US, UK and South Korea have voiced their opinions. The White House Chief Medical Advisor, Dr. Anthony Fauci, has said requiring children who attend school in person to get vaccinated against COVID-19 is a good idea. In an interview with CNN on Sunday, Fauci said a vaccine mandate would not be much different from many public schools requiring students to get vaccinated for polio or measles. The United States FDA has yet to fully approve any COVID-19 vaccines for children under the age of 12. As of now, the Pfizer shot has only received full FDA approval for use for those older than 16 and emergency use authorization for those above 12. British newspaper The Telegraph has also hinted that the United Kingdom is also considering vaccinating children as young as 12 years old. The newspaper said last Wednesday that the country's National Health Service planned to start inoculations from the first week children returned to school in September. Schools in the UK would not require parental consent to give out COVID-19 jabs because it would be given out as a school program. However, the UK Department of Health and Social Care said it has yet to decide whether to vaccinate those age groups. The Pfizer vaccine was approved in the UK in June for use on children aged 12 to 15, but authorities have not administered wide-scale inoculation, citing a lack of clinical research. And an expert from South Korea, a country that has lowered the vaccination age from 16 to 12 for Pfizer shots, but has not yet given the green light to wide-scale vaccinations to this younger age group, told that South Korea might have to wait even longer than countries like the U.S. or U.K. when it comes to making this decision. Thousands marched in Berlin to protest against government restrictions aimed at limiting the spread of the coronavirus pandemic even after demonstrations were banned. For more on this, we have other than a world news pressure correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting now from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Shanali. The protesters, the lion's share of which were unmasked despite restrictions calling for masks during large gatherings, carried signs with slogans like, Unvaccinated is the new sexy. The march comes a month before a federal election in Germany. The leading candidates wanting to replace Chancellor Angela Merkel have pledged there will be no return to the strict lockdowns of last year and earlier this year. However, the country faces a fourth wave of infections. It reported a rise of over 8,400 coronavirus cases. To nudge more people to get vaccinated, the government has said it will stop offering free tests from October 11th except for those whom vaccination is not recommended, such as children and pregnant women. The government will require people to be either vaccinated, test negative, or have a recovery certificate to enter indoor restaurants, participate in religious ceremonies, and do indoor sports. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you, and that was other than a World News Pressure correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. Police patrols in Sydney have been enforcing public health orders such as mask wearing, but the measures have done little to stop Australia's COVID-19 death toll from passing 1,000, a grim but modest number by global standards. To get more details, let's cross over to other than a World News Special Correspondent, Timothy Philip, joining us now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy. Yes, Jenna. The highly infectious Delta variant has breached the country's fortress tile controls. Entrenching itself deep enough in Sydney, Australia's biggest city, that authorities have dispensed with plans to eliminate it. Instead, the plan is to ramp up Australia's lagging vaccination effort and live with COVID-19. An approach that would help struggling businesses, but which is opposed by states determined to crush the disease. But while deaths are creeping higher, infections are surging to successive record highs, about 1,000 a day. With more than half the population in lockdown, even those areas with little or no infections are affected. As the weary nation reopens, authorities hope to avoid the soaring infections and rising death experienced in countries such as Britain and the United States. But some states that are currently largely free from infections, including Queensland and Western Australia, are pushing back against the plan. 
The rising case count means Australia will reopen under a cloud of infections when up until Delta strain, it was on track to be largely virus free. Back to you, Shana. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Timothy Philip, reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern put the country's largest city Auckland in lockdown for another two weeks today as the country recorded its first death linked to US drug maker Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Israel began offering a COVID-19 booster shot to children as young as 12 and its Prime Minister said the campaign that began a month ago among seniors had slowed a rise in severe illness caused by the Delta variant. Contaminants were found in Moderna's COVID-19 vaccines at a vaccination center in Japan's Okinawa prefecture, halting inoculations at a large-scale inoculation hub. Black substances were spotted in syringes and a vial, while pink substances were found in different syringes with the vaccine. As a number of international funding channels for Afghanistan community initiatives have been suspended since the Taliban took over, Afghanistan's health system is at risk of collapse after foreign donors stop providing aid to the country. About 100 countries have issued a joint statement saying they'll continue to take in at-risk Afghans beyond the 31st of August deadline for U.S. troops to pull out. The statement released by the U.S. said that the Taliban has issued safe passage to all foreign nationals and Afghan citizens with travel authorization. A large fire ripped through a block of flats in Milan, Italy's fire and rescue service said. According to sources, no one had been killed or injured and all residents had been successfully evacuated. We have some good news for you. The pandemic and the resulting boom in online shopping has caused a surge in cardboard waste from packaging. As South Korea works to become more eco-friendly, a local company has developed a new chemical-free way to recycle cardboard. A company in South Korea has developed a more eco-friendly way to recycle cardboard materials. Contrary to the conventional way of recycling cardboard, this new method does not require any chemicals which are harmful to the environment. This means no chemical waste or any additional expensive energy. The key idea involves cutting the used cardboard according to the fold lines and reattaching new cardboard pieces onto them. Boxes have tape marks because they are reattached to other boxes. Eco-friendly marks are stamped on them as well. Only clean boxes are recycled and they are all disinfected. During the recycling process, a special pad is inserted in between the edges of the cut pieces. Developers say the pads are made with special materials that hold the cardboard pieces together. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to prolong, South Korea is seeing a constant uptick in cardboard usage driven by an increase in home shopping and deliveries. Industry insiders are optimistic that this new method will contribute to South Korea becoming a leader in eco-friendly recycling in the future. And finally tonight, despite the pandemic, there has been quite a bit of joy in one hospital in Illinois. Several maternity ward nurses are coincidentally pregnant and expecting around the same time. The nurses are now helping each other deliver their babies, further strengthening their bond. Amid the hardship at hospitals over the past year and a half, their labor and delivery units have produced much needed good news, especially at OSF St. Joseph Medical Center in central Illinois, where that joy arrived in a set of eight. Nearly a quarter of the nurses in this unit were pregnant together, and they all work in labor and delivery, including Jordan Murrah, Sarah Hansen, and Tina Trickle, who was 13 weeks along. The friends have leaned on each other, shared baby showers, decorated each other's hospital rooms, and even helped deliver each other's babies. He's so little. Like Eli, Eloine, and Isabella. The end of a journey the nurses can all celebrate together after a difficult year for healthcare workers. Going through pregnancy with my friends feels like a total gift. That's definitely a light in the darkness in a world that's really hard right now. 
And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.